trying to clean up. I appreciate it. We're in Judges tonight, and uh, Judges chapter 20. And uh, verse 18 is where we'll pick up in our text tonight. We'll do just a little bit of review, and we, we're just going to look at a very, very simple concept this evening that I trust will be practical for all of us. And uh, if you were going to just phrase it or title it, you would just say this. We need to know how to ask God the right questions. We as believers need to know how to ask God the right questions. As we've been going through Judges, we've been looking at the character of God. We've been looking at the responses of men so we can understand our God. The God of Israel is the same God which we worship today. And God is unchanging. People change, trends change, times change, dispensations even change. We're not the same dispensation that Israel is in. But God has not changed. And so if you know how God works with His people, you know how God works with you. And so this evening we're going to read in our text. We're going to make a couple of simple points, do some review, and this will be it in our study in Judges for a while. Here we are in chapter 20 and verse 18. The Bible says, And the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God and said, Which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. And the children of Israel rose up in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. And the men of Israel put themselves in array to fight against them at Gibeah. And the children of Benjamin came forth out of Gibeah and destroyed down the ground of the Israelites that day, 20 and 2,000 men. The people of Israel encouraged themselves and set their battle again in array in the place where they put themselves in array the first day. And the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until evening and even asked the council Lord, saying, Shall I go up again to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the Lord said, Go up against him. And the children of Israel came near against the children of Benjamin the second day. And Benjamin went forth against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed down to the ground of the children of Israel. Again, 18,000 men, all these drew the sword. Then the children of Israel, that's, that's 40,000. 22,000 plus 18,000 is 40,000. And those, that's 40,000 individuals. That's catastrophic, isn't it? Then all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came to the house of God and wept and sat there before the Lord fasted that day until even and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into thine hand. Father, as we look at this circumstance where it seems so confusing trying to figure out what you're doing at times, Lord, may we come to a place of understanding about the way that we should view you and even the way that we should ask you about our actions. Lord, I just thank you so much. Thank you so much for this account in the Scripture. And though it's difficult for us, thank you that it teaches us important truths as we seek for hidden treasures here. We pray that you'll help us to find them tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's do a little bit of review. Let's remember our theme, what we're studying in, in Judges. In Judges chapter 1 and chapter 2, uh, we see God's response to Israel not driving out the inhabitants of the land. If you remember, and it seems like it's been a while since we've looked at it, but God's people were told to utterly drive out the inhabitants, and they didn't do it. And tribe by tribe, uh, Judges 1 and Judges Judges 1 in particular goes through telling us the failures in driving out the inhabitants of the land. Ultimately, because of their rebellion against the Lord, or ultimately the children, because of the inhabitants of the land, began to follow after the idols of those in the land. And God ultimately told them, I'm never going to drive them out before you. I'm going to leave them in the land for two reasons. You remember the two reasons? To leave the inhabitants of the land in the land that God promised Israel in the promised land? Teach them what? How to fight. Yep, teach them how to go to war. So, well, if you're going to have the inhabitants, we'll use them for practice. Learn how to fight. What else? Testing. What? To prove them. To prove them whether they would honor God in their generation. Now, friend, 
you and I need to realize that the blame game gets us nowhere. Somebody, a friend of mine posted, a pastor posted the blame game this week. He was, he was blaming the baby boomers. And we've got quite a few baby boomers here tonight, don't we? Several. John, you're a baby boomer, right? You and Ann and, and Al. So. Al's older than the baby oh, boomers, so I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> Can't pass without giving Al a hard time. Frank, you're too young to be a baby boomer. Are you a baby boomer? Are you a baby boomer? Five. Yeah, you're you're well we'll count you. So we've got a, quite quite a few. Mrs. Dollins, you're a baby boomer, aren't you? Yeah. So we've got probably almost a majority of baby boomers here this evening. Anyway, a pastor friend of mine said something to the effect that the reason we have the trouble in America today and trouble in leadership today is because the baby boomers are now in charge and we are getting the results of the baby boomers rebellion in our generation so he basically said don't look at us don't blame the young generation blame yourselves but what he was doing was blaming the baby boomer generation and I'll just tell you this God wanted for the nation of Israel, for them in every generation, to prove themselves whether they would honor the Lord. And you and I can look at the failures of our fathers all day long, but unless we just simply look and say, our fathers do not serve the Lord, but we will serve the Lord, unless we look at it from that perspective, all we're going to do is say, well, the reason we're the way they are is because the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, and God hates that. Christian, your best scenario, the best thing you can do is to stop playing the blame game. That's the world's game. That's not God's game, and it doesn't work with God. You've got to stop saying, my circumstances, and say, okay, I am responsible for my circumstances. You know, after about the age of accountability, you're responsible for your circumstances with God. Do you ever think about that? I do believe there's an age of accountability. There's an age when you can understand that you're a sinner and that you're responsible to God for your sin and that if you don't receive the work of the cross, then God will condemn you rightfully because you've owned your own responsibility. That's age of accountability. And I'll just tell you something. From a child's age of accountability, that's about the time you need to stop blaming your parents. Kids said, my mom and dad let me, or my mom and dad shouldn't have, or my mom and dad... Well, that may be true, but it's not going to change anything. See, you and I don't have to look at things and say, well, you know, I know but people never change. That's not up to us. People do change. But it has nothing to do with whether or not God will hold me accountable for my actions. And God wanted Israel to literally be accountable in every generation for her own actions. And so God said, I'm going to leave these inhabitants in the land, and you're going to have to choose between God and them in every generation. Friend, if you've chosen between following the Lord Jesus and following the world, you've done the same thing. You know, every one of us has a choice. Every one of us chooses who we're going to serve. And so God was using the inhabitants of the land. It's one of the things we learned early on. But a theme that one of the themes that has come out as we've studied through Judges is the matter of vows. Jephthah is the best example of an individual who made a vow to God that God didn't require him to make. And it had disastrous results. had disastrous consequences. And uh, it, it, it was something that God didn't require of Jephthah. So a dangerous situation. We learned about vows. Not to make vows that God doesn't ask us to make. And if you're going to make a vow, make a vow that you're going to keep. Uh, Jephthah kept his vow. He was a good example in that. But we saw several examples, one in the law and one in Ecclesiastes, which of course would have been written later, where we're to keep ourselves from making vows. We're to take it very, very seriously. God doesn't require a vow. And if God doesn't require a vow, don't make one unless God asks you to or God tells you to. Uh, Samson is a guy that would be an exception to that, isn't he? Hey, God wanted him to be a Nazarite. And so he had a vow. He had things that God wanted him to do from birth. So if God wants you to make a vow, keep it. But if God doesn't want you to make a vow, friend, don't fall into this trap of personal holiness. And I, I better rephrase that because that sounds... You could really take that and misconstrue it, couldn't you? You need to be personal and holy. But don't fall into this trap of trying to earn your own worth or your own merit before God. God will never be impressed by what you bring to Him. God's never going to say, wow, that's a dedicated Christian. I would have never expected that. I can't believe it. No, God knows anything you do is by His grace. 
It's, it's through Him. It's, it's His ability. And God, God's ability is greater than our ability. And we're impressed by God's grace, but He's not. And so if you're going to do something in your strength, it will not even begin to enter the, the compare, or it begin to be comparable to God's grace and what God can do. God can do far more for you in His strength than you can do in your strength. But God will never be impressed with anything you can do in His strength because it's far less than He could do through you. So be careful about this matter of vows. We're going to look at one more aspect this evening. Uh, and, and this has always been a confusing uh, question for me as I've read through this. I've always asked the question, why did 40,000 men have to die? You ever ask that question? Why did 40,000 men have to die? There are several instances in the scripture when people died and it just seemed almost like it was just too tragic to be necessary. Um, in, uh, when David numbered the people and the death of the people, that was just tragic. Uh, and when, when uh, the sons of Saul, it was a Gibeah, the Gibeonites that they had wronged. Who was it the sons of Saul had wronged and God judged Israel and David offered an offering and God says because of the sons of Israel and they actually gave him the sons of Saul this is after Saul was already gone but they had not been avenged of the wrong I can't I can't remember off the top of my head just this last week but again that's uh, that's my failing memory you can read it in the, in the scripture but that's another instance where it seemed like people died and it just almost seemed like why didn't God just say hey y'all need to take care of this or people are going to die sometimes we see Individuals who are God's people rush into tragic into tragedy and tra have tragic results. It's almost like this is needless. I, in in more contemporary times, of course, it's not Israel. America is not Israel, but the Civil War to me is the most tragic, uh, the the most tragic por portion of American history possible. I'll just tell you something. You say, Pastor, would you be a Southerner or would you be a Northerner? It's just so tragic. I I mean, it's just both sides were right and both sides were wrong. You know, it's just, just such a tough, tough issue. But what was so tragic about it is, honestly, I believe that, that the bloodshed was needless. If, God's, if, if the people who named the name of God had done right, the war never had to happen. And that's the honest truth. If preachers had not tried to defend slavery, it would have made a huge difference. If, if uh, the, the battle had been fought in the pulpit, and from the Word of God. But the fact of the matter is, is that people want to take the Word of God and adjust it to their lifestyle and to what they wanted. And there's, it's so tragic. You know, the Civil War is, is the nearest thing I can think of the tragedy. But this matter of the Benjamites, I don't want to go through the graphics of the story of what led up to this, but it's really a terrible thing. The Benjamites had committed a sin in Israel. Uh, they, they were just an abomination. They literally had done things that were so terrible that... The Israelites were actually outraged. Even though they had fallen into idolatry and worshiping idols and so forth, the Benjamites had committed such a wicked sin against a man and uh, against his concubine that the rest of the children of Israel said, we've got to deal with this. And they told the men of Benjamin to deliver these, these wicked men to them, and they refused. And so the men of Israel said, okay, we're going to go to battle. And here's where we find ourselves in our text this evening and making a simple point that we're going to look at. The question the men of Israel asked, the Bible says they went up to the house of God and they asked counsel of God and said, which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? Now, I don't want to make much of this, but I just want us to understand this. Do you understand that when you ask God a yes or no or God pick one of 12, you ask God a multiple choice question, it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. How many is it to 12? How many letters of the alphabet? Whatever it is. It's, it's, what's the 12th letter of the L. alphabet? L. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, so A through L. Pick one. I hope you're right about it. All right, A through L. Pick, pick your choice, God. Which one of us? And God said, uh, Judah. But the problem is the question should have been, God, what should we do about Benjamin? In other words, the outrage here is, is proper, isn't it so? I mean, you read the Scripture and you see what Benjamin had done and you saw that Benjamin was unrepentant and defended the wicked. You realize that this tribe of God's people needed to be dealt with. But the question should have been, God, how do you want to deal with this? 
But what they did was they went up to God and they said, God, which one of the tribes would you like to go up to battle? And God said, Judah. And so Judah went. There were 400,000 men of war in Israel. 22,000 of them lost. That's, those aren't good numbers. Those aren't good stats. And, and honestly, it's just it's astonishing. It should have been enough. 22,000 men should have been enough, and they were, they were surprised by it, so they regrouped. And they went back again, and they lost again, and 18,000 men died. <laughs> the problem with the whole thing, as I see it in the Scripture, my friend, is that they never asked God whether or not they should go up to battle. They simply said, God, which one of us would you like to go? You know, you and I, my friend, are oftentimes guilty of putting God in a position where He is going to judge us because He's not the Lord in our life. Now, I, I, you know I don't believe in lordship salvation, but I believe in biblical lordship. I believe that God needs to be the one who has the authority, who has the say in our lives, and Taj does too. He likes it when you ask who has the final say. Uh, anyway, God needs to be the one that calls the shots in our life. But what they did was they said, well, God, you tell us which one of us goes, but we're going. Now, what are the assumptions that they made? What are the assumptions that they made? Somebody help me with it. God what? what? God wanted to go. They assumed God wanted them to go. Why? Because of what Benjamin had done. Benjamin had done something wicked. They knew that God was against what Benjamin had done. Isn't it so? So they assumed God wanted them to go. What are the what are their assumptions? Now was the time. What? Now was the time to go. Yeah, they assumed that the time to go was when they were going to go. They made an assumption about the time. What else? They assumed they'd win. They never asked God, "Will you give us the victory?" They said, "Should we go?" Or which one of us should go? So they never asked if they should go. They never asked when they should go. And they never asked if they were going to win. And so they didn't give God the option. Now, friend, let me just tell you something. I could give you personal examples. I don't, but I could give you personal examples of people that I've counseled who have come to me seeking counsel, but their desire or their action that they're going to take they're A or B or C or D or E, none of them are open to F or G or nothing at all. <laughs> Pastor, I'm thinking about moving. I'm thinking about moving here or here. What do you think I should move to? Mars. You know, I mean, honestly, what difference does it make if, if God doesn't want you to move at all? You know? <laughs> I can give you, and then, then they, they come back, well, you know, I moved to Mars and it, there was no water. It was all ice. You know, why did God do this to me? Yeah, I'm going to just tell you something, Christian. You and I need to learn how to ask God questions. We need to learn how to call on God. You know, very few believers know how to say, God, I'm motionless. I am still until you tell me to move. You know, an important part of knowing God's will in your life is knowing to do nothing until God wants you. Now, I'm not talking about not serving Him. You can serve God where you're at. Anything, any, anything or argument that you would have to say you can't serve God where you're at is nothing but a cop-out. It's an excuse. Wherever you are, there are lost people you can share the gospel with. Wherever you are, you can be faithful to the Lord. You can be what you're supposed to be. If you're in a situation where you know God doesn't want you in it, you don't necessarily have to go somewhere else. You have to extract yourself from whatever the situation is. But many times you and I go to God and say, God, I'm about to. Now, would you rather I did this or this? And you find two options that you're agreeable with, but you're not one bit concerned about what God wants. See, the assumption here is, I want this, therefore God must. And my question is, did God want the children of Israel to go up against Benjamin? Well, I think the answer to that would be yes. He did. But you know, there was a problem in Israel. The problem in Israel was not just that Benjamin was so wicked that he, that he was responsible for these atrocities as a tribe in Israel. The problem in Israel was that not only was Benjamin so wicked, but it took something like this to get people to even consider talking to God to begin with. 
In other words, they had no relationship with God. The rest of the tribes, they're not accustomed to asking God what to do. They're confused about it. And when they come to God, they come to God saying, well, you know what? There's no king in Israel. Every man does that which is right in his own eyes. That's what we see in 17.6 and we see in the last verse in chapter, uh, was it 21? Thank you. (laughs) That's what we see in those two instances. And what they're doing is what's right in their own eyes and they're not one bit concerned with whether or not God wants it. And you know something? To say there's no king in Israel in those days meant there's no earthly king. But Israel was a theocracy. Gideon said, Israel has a king. It's Jehovah. Capital L-O-R-D. All caps. Jehovah God is our king. And if they'd wanted to know what to do, they could have asked God. Well, then that just brings us to our simple conclusion. After they've lost 40,000 men, the Bible says in verse 26, then all the children of Israel and all the people. You notice this? All the children of Israel and all the people. And so what it seems to indicate is that everybody around, Jews, proselytes, um, all the different tribes, that says they went up and came unto the house of God and wept. And notice the next two words. Would you read those out with out loud with me? And wept and sat. Sat there before the Lord. Friend, before you ask God to do anything, you better start by doing nothing. This is different, isn't it? Before they came up before the Lord, they went up to the house of God, they asked counsel of God, said, which of us shall go? Pick one. This time, they came up to God, and they wept, and they sat before the Lord. In other words, now they said, okay, God, we're not doing anything until we know what you want. And there's a big difference, isn't there? You know what happens when you sit... This is something that we need to learn. We need to learn silence. Sitting is silence. These individuals wept, the Bible says, and then they sat. There's other places in the Scripture when it says this individual sat astonished or astonished, just like speechless. Nothing going on. And this is something you and I need to think a lot about because we live in a generation where we literally have robotic minds. We're in the media generation. We thought our parents were in the media generation, but we're in the media generation like no one else. I mean, I'm in conversation myself today, and I'm sending emails and texts and talking to people. You know, I mean, just, you know, I try I try pretty hard when I, when I spend time with people. I try to set my phone down, turn it upside down, even turn the volume off, just so I don't get a notification, because I don't even think about it. I check to see if it was a text or an email or whether it's an emergency or whatever it is, because I'm just used to it. And I'll tell you something I've le- I learned to do years ago. I learned in my car to turn the radio off. To be able to just drive my car in silence. And it's amazing. I, get, I rarely ever get in a vehicle with somebody that their stereo isn't on. That something isn't playing. That something isn't happening in it. To keep their mind captivated. And, and I'll just tell you something. It's, you're just... Without your thought, without your consideration, your mind is just being fed whatever is pumped in. Now I know you can make the choice to pump good things in or pump bad things in. Sometimes I do a media fast. I just think I can. I I, I feel like every time I hear bad news, I got to do something about it, and I just can't handle hearing everything bad. It's just too much, too much. Sometimes I have to say, you know what? I don't know about it. Sometimes people tell me, did you hear about such and so? I heard that happen, but I don't know the details of it. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not really going to check into it right now because I can't deal with it. God hasn't called me to solve the world's problems. He's called me to have the ministry Ryan Price is supposed to have in order to know that there has to be a time of stillness, a time of silence. I challenge you, try being quiet sometime. And not having to flip on the television or flip on the radio or flip on something that just pumps, takes control of your mind so you don't have to think. The children of Israel in their generation literally had the same issue. God, we're going to go, we're going to do, we're going to get them. Who who do you want to go? Okay, Judah, go. What happened? Okay, we're going to go again, we're going to do it again. What happened? 
And all of a sudden they realize we're in big trouble. We've made vows now. We've promised to destroy Benjamin. We've got to do it. Doesn't look like it can be done. Now Benjamin's going to be coming after us. We're, right, we're in the middle of this thing. Something has to be done. We're in a mess. And they came to a place when they realized this is such a mess, we don't know what we're going to do. And then they had a eureka moment. Aha. Maybe we should ask God. And it started by their not having an opinion. Try this. Try it. So I'm not saying this is the way we always have to be. I'm not saying that this applies in every instance, but it ought to be the way we begin. Try not having an opinion about something. Just try not. What do you think about? Instead of just blurting the first thing that comes to your mind, how about not knowing? Pastor, what should we do about Islam? Well, I could blob, blab a bunch of things. But God has an opinion about it. Don't you think? The truth of the matter is I don't think anyone knows. Sometimes you and I need to just say, you know what? <laughs> we better find out what God wants. Because this could be a real disaster. I was thinking about it. Some of these guys are making some promises that I appreciate. I, I'm not against what Donald Trump has said this last week about Islam. Let's tell you something. Islam is not a religion. Islam is a, an, it's, it's a politicized movement. It's a radical politicized movement. Allah is not God. And I don't want to get into all the details of it, but no Muslim will renounce Sharia, and no one who believes in Sharia believes in any other way of life but Sharia. That's the reality. Now, I don't want to, we don't need to debate the details of it. If you don't know what Sharia is, you're deliberately ignorant on your own, and I can't convince you of anything. You've got to study up and figure it out yourself. But I'll just tell you something. Donald Trump said last, last week that we should stop Muslims from coming into the United States until we find out whether or not they're radical or not and so forth. And he's taken a lot of heat for it. But I'll just tell you something. I don't disagree with him. I don't agree with him either. I think about it. I think if I were president, what would be the way to keep America safe when radicalized individuals... I shouldn't even use the term radicalized. When Islamists are coming here for the purpose of destroying our country. we got Americans that are like, you know, we should be benevolent. We should have them come. Well, I, I like that. Uh, but the problem is when people want to kill you, it's kind of hard to, you know, be benevolent to them for more than just a little while. Uh, but... The fact of the matter is that if Donald Trump, <laughs> this is, let's don't even, let's don't go there. It's too discouraging to think about. Supposing somebody were elected and decided that, that we were going to stamp out Islam in America, do you think there might be some bad repercussions from that? Might it be a problem? Might it be a powder keg that's greater than we could handle? We have no idea, actually, do we? Because we'd have to know what God wanted. I mean, honestly, I appreciate what Mr. Huckabee said this last week. He said, that if I am elected president, the first thing I'll do my first day is I'm going to pray. And I'm going to ask God what to do. In other words, before I go off doing what I think and saying, God, now here's what I'm going to do, A or B or C, God, I, <laughs> I know this is beyond me. This, this is a task beyond me. And by the way, what about the church? Huh? Did, should we as a church? I mean, we've got great ideas, don't we? We've got things we could do, but what about just saying, God, should we go up? Or should we sit? God, should we move? And you know what we need to do first? We need to come to a place when we realize... We don't even know God well enough to know what God would do. See, that's, that's the crux of it. That's the issue. The children of Israel didn't know God well enough to even know what God would want them to do. They didn't know that God would like to tell them to go up or to stay. They just assumed vengeance is ours when vengeance was God's. And they could have been the instrument of vengeance if God wanted it, but God could have sent hellfire or hail or brimstone or he could have, God could have dealt with them on His own. I mean, you know, it's interesting that it's the grandson of Aaron here 
that is the priest representing him. What happened to Aaron's uncles when they offered strange fire to the Lord? Poof. God dealt with it. God could have done that with Benjamin. And God has done that with individuals in the past. But they never gave God that option. They said, God, which tribe? And now they have taken a, come to a place where they have wept. They've mourned. You say, Pastor, well, what are they mourning here? Well, they're mourning the loss of 40,000 men in Israel. But you know what else they're mourning? They're mourning the fact that they really don't even know their God. And this is the good in the situation. The good in the situation is that the circumstances have forced them to say, who is God? And what does He want? You know, sometimes, my friend, when we get into carrying on and acting on our own so much, sometimes it's good for God just to blow us away. So we have to come to a place and we say, who is God and what does He want? We've got to acquaint ourselves. And the way to acquaint yourself is to have sorrow for sin and to have stillness where you listen to God. When's the last time you listened to God? We tell God all the time what we think, don't we? It's amazing how much prayer, individuals that don't understand prayer, how much prayer is just our conversing to God and then assuming that what we said to God about Himself is what He's saying to us. You ever talk something out to yourself when you're trying to troubleshoot a problem? I do. I've talked through something. I'm working on a car. Okay, now, first of all, you know, okay, it's, cr it's, it's, it's cranking over but nothing's happening. It's not firing. Okay, how fast? Is it turn over fast enough to fall? Okay, yeah, it seems like it has plenty of volts. Just take, okay, 12 volts, okay. Well, it's, I mean, it really comes down to fuel and spark. Uh, you know, it's got to, got to have spark. Let's check. Okay, it's got spark. And it's got to see if it's got fuel pressure. Okay, it's got fuel. Now, it's got fuel and spark. Now, why isn't it starting? Okay, so then you start checking a few other things, and all of a sudden, voila, you find whatever the thing is. You know, talk yourself through it. That's how we deal with God sometimes. God, and we, you know, we think we're quoting His promises to Him, but we're just developing the aspect or attribute of God that will make Him respond to us the way that He wants. We want Him to. Now, God, you know, this is what's going on in my life right now. And God, I know that You're very merciful, and so You'd want, you know, me to this, thus, and so. And God, this is what I'm doing right now, and this is what I think. And so I think this is what You think, don't You think? And God doesn't say anything because You don't give Him a chance. And you go and say, okay, now that You think that, well, I think I'm gonna go ahead and do. Thanks for your help, God. He never talked to God. He never said a word to you. If He'd said something to you, you would have been still. You don't begin doing something and ask God if He wants it or not. You stop doing it. And you say, God, do you want this or not? I, as far as I'm concerned, it's not going to happen unless you say. You don't do something and then say, well, God, you know, you want this? Well, God, this is the path I'm going. You know, close the door if you don't want it. And God slams the door and you're like, man, that door was shut. How am I going to get around that? And you go to the next one and you just keep on moving because you're going to do what you're going to do. And you've got your own God. You have a virtual God and He's made up in your mind, but He doesn't have a say in your life. He doesn't have anything to say in your life because you're not listening. And then ultimately, disaster strikes. And then you say, well, God, what went wrong? I told you I was going to do this. I asked you if you had a problem with it. And you only slammed a couple doors that I went around on the way. Phineas, the son of Eliezer, verse 28, the son of Aaron stood before it in those days, saying, this before the Ark of the Covenant, shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? That's the right question. God, should I go to battle or should I not? And the Lord said, go up, for tomorrow I'll deliver them in the thine hand. And Israel set liars in waiting round about Gibeah. And then we, as you, if you read on, you see the end result of this and the mess. The fiasco that's ultimately created, then they have to find wives for Benjamin and recreate this tribe that they've almost destroyed because they've put God in kind of a position here. And ultimately, Judges chapter 21 and verse 25, we end with, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which is right in his own eyes. And this evening, friend, if you and I could take anything uh, from the text tonight, if we could learn anything from this passage of Scripture, I think the thing we ought to learn is that you and I need to be still. And we need to say, God... Should we go or should we stop? And it should be after you've already stopped. We ask God to bless us a lot of times. 
We want God's blessing many times, but we're not concerned about whether or not God wants it. And that was the mistake of Israel here. Oh, there's sin in Israel and it needed to be dealt with. But you and I have no idea, and Israel has no idea what God could have done if they had begun by saying, God, what should we do? They had a priest. They had the Ark of the Covenant. They had a God who was interested, who was concerned, who loved them, who cared about them, and who certainly had an opinion. And had they sought God's counsel first, I believe that there were perhaps 65,000 individuals that need not have died. You say, Pastor, 65, well, 40 of the, of the 11 tribes and then 25,000 of Benjamin died. And I have no idea what God could have done to turn Benjamin. But you know, God has turned the wicked before. God has shown the wicked their sin and they've turned. And they never asked God about that. They just put him in a situation where he had to vindicate the, them against the wicked. You have no idea what God might could do in your life. You know, when it comes to relationships, so many individuals, I don't know how many people come to me after they've decided they're going to get divorced and they want marriage counseling. It's a little late. You're already, you're already taking steps. Well, Pastor, if you can save our marriage before it's finalized, you know. Well, to be frank with you, I doubt anyone could. You're going to do what you're going to do unless God stops you. Sometimes He's gracious and merciful enough to, but you're going to do it. You enter a relationship, and you want to go that direction, you want to push for it, and you're just going to do it, and you say, well, you know what, if God doesn't want it, you know, God, if you don't want this, tell me. If God were to tell you, you'd be dead. Honestly. Because that's the only thing you'd listen to. I've seen it, I don't know how many times, individuals... Unless God kills me, I'm doing it. So it must be God's will because I'm not dead. And what you forget is that God's very long-suffering is very merciful. And we do it with things like buying a house, like taking a job, like whatever else. We're not too concerned about what God wants. We speak out and we're opinionated. And before we ever ask God about something, we know what we should do or what should be done. But we really don't know what God wants. And that was the problem in Israel when there was no king and every man did that which is right in his own eyes. Friend, God help me to not be described as an individual who did that which was right in his own eyes. Because I can justify anything, and so can you. And if we're going to live that way, that's a godless existence. Father, help us to learn from your word the lesson that is so plainly apparent. God, I pray that you would help us, even at this time of the year when we're so rushed and so bustling and trying to accomplish so many things to take time and have stillness and say God is this even what you want help us to ask you before we speak and before we act Lord I pray that your spirit would take the knowledge that we have from your word now and that you would convict us about specific circumstances and show us your way in these we pray and ask for your help in Jesus name Amen Okay let's take prayer requests